Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I always had personal feelings, you know, about art and so forth. I mean, for instance, uh, with the Marilyn Triptych, there is a nude Marilyn there. And when I painted that nude Marilyn, I mean, she just died. That nude Marilyn wasn't an erotic thing in the sense. It wasn't a pornographic Marilyn or anything like that. It was Marilyn who was kind of a sweet girl that had been caught up in Hollywood, you know. Her tragic death in 1962 was taken up as a motif by the ever-growing pop art movement. In a window of time between 1962 and 1967, a selected circle of pop art artists took up Marilyn Monroe as a significant art theme. To this day, Marilyn Monroe is represented by countless artists. Thousands and thousands of them ascribe themselves to pop art, although this original movement peaked in the 1960s and produced a self-contained canon of artists. Andy Warhol, James Rosenquist, Klaus Oldenburg, Robert Indiana, Tom Wesselman, and James Francis Gill. The number of pop art artists who portrayed Marilyn Monroe in their works in the 1960s and established her as an art icon is limited. The night of August 4th to 5th, 1962, and the mysterious circumstances of her death established her myth as an art object. The years 1962 and 1963 were defining in terms of art history. American pop artists James Francis Gill and Andy Warhol were the first, along with James Rosenquist. Immediately after her death, they painted significant works of her. Tom Wesselman, Klaus Oldenburg, and Robert Indiana followed. It's, you know, it's a difficult life to make what's right and what's wrong. But anyway, I felt sorry for Marilyn, and I saw her especially there at the last. She was naked in the sense of she was bared to the public. I mean, I remember articles like, nude Marilyn, da da da, you know. I mean, I can see why it was even bothering her because Marilyn really wanted to just have a happy life. I mean, she was kind of a happy girl. When James Francis Gill arrived in Los Angeles, the city was in shock after the actress's death. Gill began painting in his Manhattan Beach studio, only about a 30-minute drive from the Brentwood neighborhood, Monroe's death site. Life magazine dated August 3rd was on the table in his studio. He saw the pictures of the actress published in it and used them as an inspiration for his Marilyn triptych. The triptych tells, from left to right, the complete life story of Marilyn, with all its tragedy in a simple way, but yet complex and with depth. Gill did not use the nudity in his triptych in an erotic sense. Gill rather provided an insight into her deepest psyche. Right down to the open, light-flooded door, Marilyn's final destination. Well, she was dealing with something then that uh um, just one of a time, it was, it was to be a movie star, and she didn't necessarily, I mean, that was to be beautiful and be in front of the camera. You know, Hollywood takes its toll. The poor girl had to take a pill to wake up and a pill to go to bed, a pill to be nice, and, and she was kind of a delicate creature. She couldn't handle all that. I couldn't either. <laughs> His dealer, Felix Landau, saw it and was fascinated. He brought the triptych across the USA to his business partner, the gallery owner Charles Allen in New York. Allen planned Gill's first exhibition in New York for December 1962. Almost at the same time as Gill's exhibition in the Allen Gallery, Andy Warhol also had his first solo exhibition in New York. 
so Gill's work was exhibited about a half mile away from Warhol's works. Gill's Maryland Triptych in one gallery and Warhol's Maryland Diptych and Gold Marilyn Monroe in the other. Andy Warhol visited the show at the Allen Gallery. He wanted to see Gill's Triptych. Later, Warhol told young Gill that he liked his Marilyn. But then the whole pop art scene just kind of took over the world. It became, I mean, it's incredible to think of paintings bringing a million dollars, you know, but that's, that's life. Andy Warhol was not the only major figure to admire Gill's Maryland triptych in the early winter of 1962. Alfred Hamilton Barr, Jr., the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art, also frequented New York's galleries. In his capacity as director of collections, he scoured the gallery landscape to find new works of art of particular significance for MoMA's collection. Barr was fascinated by Marilyn Monroe. He was very interested in the Monroe mythology and the symbolism that her death provoked. His enthusiasm infected other members of the collections committee at MoMA. At the day Barr presented the triptych to the board of trustees, John de Manil was present, who together with his wife Dominique, built up the Manil collection, one of the largest and still most important art collections in the USA. Philip Johnson was present as well, one of the most important architects of U.S. modernism and co-founder of postmodernism. Johnson had already purchased Warhol's gold Marilyn Monroe at the Stables Gallery and later donated it to MoMA. Everyone was eagerly awaiting Barr's remarks, who had positioned himself in front of the triptych. The architect Johnson later recalled that when Barr had finished his presentation of Gill's work, everyone in the room was moist-eyed and touched by his description of the masterpiece. John de Manil was also impressed by Barr's explanations. That evening, he told his wife Dominique about the triptych and Barr's moving talk. Dominique went to MoMA the very next day, saw the work, and was just as impressed as her husband. In a personal letter to Barr in February 1963, John de Manil described his emotions as follows. Dominique and I cannot resist giving to the Museum of Modern Art the Gill Triptych of Marilyn Monroe. When I walked into the boardroom the other day, it struck me as the interesting piece. And then you talked. I was irresistibly moved by your own emotion and by the intelligence and perception with which you analyzed the subject and showed it as going beyond the episodic into the far reaches of humanity. Dominique, to whom I told the story, saw the piece the following day and reacted as we had. So, the museum may purchase this triptych as a gift from Dominique and John de Menil. And although this cannot be said in the credit line, it is a tribute to Alfred Barr, a man with passions. Barr was very interested in the symbolism that Marilyn Monroe's death evoked. But why did Gill's triptych catch his attention so much? Made in the form of an altarpiece, it shows us a religious symbolism. Excitingly, Warhol also used this style. The golden field of his gold Marilyn Monroe, the only one of Warhol's Marilyns to use this color, also recalls the religious icons of Christian art history as a border for her face. Shortly afterwards, starting in 1964, Alfred H. Barr curated an exhibition at MoMA in which both Gill's Marilyn Triptych and Warhol's Gold Marilyn Monroe were shown to the general public for the first time as new acquisitions of the museum. Barr was considered a visionary. Did he foresee the cult of Marilyn Monroe shortly after her death? The wave that washed Monroe into the galleries and museums as an art icon was now finally unstoppable. And I still, you know, I mean, I've always been related to and a part of pop art. I'm, I'm really happy with, with what I've done and where I've been and, you know, I wouldn't trade for it. I, I'm just really uh, happy with what I do. 
In December 1967, New York Sydney Janus Gallery curated the exhibition to homage to Marilyn Monroe, which is still groundbreaking today. Five years after Monroe's death, this exhibition brought together leading and important Monroe artists for the first time. The exhibition, Homage to Marilyn Monroe, is still considered as an outstanding collection of significant artists. All works belong to pop art in the English or American sense. Today's artists who take up the theme of Monroe in their works still profit from these pioneering masters. If Marilyn Monroe still serves as an inspiration for fashion today or as a cautionary example to the uplifting and equally destructive power of the media and images, then this will always be closely connected with the name of James Francis Gill, who, with a small group of American pop artists, defined this icon. Fame and success led to emptiness and death for Monroe. Gill recognized this. He wanted to be happy, so he left Los Angeles and the material art world. According to his own statement, this saved his life. So it's been, um, been an incredible ride for these 60 years of Maryland's and of women in cars and a few other things, but mostly Mostly that. Each Marilyn he paints in his late work is not only a representation of an icon he co-founded with other pop art giants, but always a part of his own personal life story.